Hello and welcome to the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured Chapter 10 Airway Management Lecture. After you complete this lesson and the related coursework, you will understand the need for proper airway management, including recognizing and measuring adequate and inadequate breathing, maintaining an open airway, and providing artificial ventilation. You will be able to demonstrate basic competency in applying these concepts to appropriate care through the use of airway adjuncts, suction equipment, oxygen equipment and delivery systems, pulse oximetry, and continuous positive airway pressure, and other resuscitation devices. So let's get started. The single most important step in caring for patients is to address life threats, and a primary component of that step is to ensure that they can breathe adequately. When the ability to breathe is disrupted, oxygen delivery to tissues and cells is compromised. Cells require a constant supply of oxygen to survive. Within seconds of being deprived of oxygen, vital organs such as the heart and the brain may not function normally. Brain tissue will begin to die within four to six minutes without oxygen. Oxygen reaches body tissues and cells through two separate but related processes, and these two are breathing and circulation. During inhalation, oxygen moves from the atmosphere into the lungs. Oxygen then crosses the alveolar membrane and attaches to hemoglobin by the process called diffusion. Red blood cells carry hemoglobin and therefore oxygen through the body, ultimately delivering it to the capillaries to oxygenate the body cells. At the same time, carbon dioxide produced by the cells in the tissues of the body moves from the blood into air sacs by diffusion. Oxygen and rich blood is pumped through the body by the heart and carbon dioxide leaves the body during exhalation. As an EMT, you must be able to locate the parts of the respiratory system, understand how the system works, and recognize which patients are breathing adequately and which are not. The figure on this slide illustrates the upper and lower airways of the human body. Okay, so let's now talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system. The respiratory system consists of all the structures that make up the airway and help us breathe and ventilate. The airway is divided into the upper and lower airways. So let's talk about the structures that help us breathe. This is the diaphragm, chest wall muscles, and accessory muscles of breathing. Nerves from the brain and the spinal cord to those muscles also help us breathe. Ventilation is the exchange of air between the lungs and the environment. The diaphragm and chest wall muscles are responsible for the regular rise and fall of the chest that accompany normal breathing. Anatomy of the upper airway. So the upper airway consists of all the anatomic airway structures above the vocal cords. So these include the nose, the mouth, the jaw, oral cavity, the pharynx, and the larynx. The main function of the upper airway is to warm, filter, and humidify the air as it enters the body. Okay, so let's talk about the pharynx. That's the muscular tube extending from the nose and the mouth to the level of the esophagus and trachea. It's composed from the top to bottom of the nasopharynx, oral pharynx, and laryngeopharynx. So the nasopharynx, it's lined with cellulated mucous membranes that filter out dusk and small particles, warms and humidifies air as it enters the body. The oral pharynx is the posterior portion of the oral cavity. The epiglottis is superior to the larynx. It helps prevent food and liquid from entering the larynx during swallowing. The figure on this slide shows the oral cavity. And then the larynx, the complex structure formed by many independent cartilaginous structures. It marks where the upper airway ends and the lower airway begins. The thyroid cartilage forms a V shape interiorly, and that's the Adam's apple. The cricoid cartilage, known as a cricoid ring, forms the lowest portion of the larynx. The cricoid membrane 
is the elastic tissue that connects the thyroid superiorly to the cricoid ring inferiorly. The glottis, which is the glottic opening, is the area between the vocal cords. It's the narrowest part of the adult's airway. Vocal cords are white bands of thin muscle tissue. They are partially separated at rest. They produce speech and they protect the trachea from the entry of substances like water and vomitus. Okay, so now let's talk about the elements of the lower airway. You have the trachea, which is the windpipe. It's a conduit for air entry into the lungs. It begins directly below the cricoid cartilage, and it descends anteriorly down the midline of the neck into the thoracic cavity. In the thoracic cavity, the trachea divides at the carina into two main stem bronchi, the left and the right. The bronchi are separated by cartilage. They distribute oxygen to the two lungs. Lung tissue is covered with the visceral pleura. It's a slippery outer membrane. And then the parental pleura lines the inside of the thoracic cavity. On entering the lungs, each bronchius divides into even smaller bronchi, which divides into bronchioles. The figure on this slide shows the trachea and lungs in the lower airway. Bronchioles are made of smooth muscle. They dilate and constrict as oxygen passes through them. Smaller bronchioles connect to alveoli. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged here. Alveoli are millions of thin-walled, balloon-like sacs. Alveoli are surrounded by blood vessels, and these are the pulmonary capillaries, and oxygen diffuses across the alveolar membrane into the pulmonary capillaries. Oxygen in the pulmonary capillaries are transported back to the lungs and distributed to the rest of the body. Carbon dioxide, which is the waste product, diffuses from the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli where it is exhaled and removed from the body. The heart and great vessels, which are the vena cava and the aorta, are also present in the thoracic cavity and are important for respiration. The mediastinum is the area between the lungs which contains the heart, great vessels, esophagus, trachea, major bronchi, many nerves. The phrenic nerve is also found in the thorax. It's an important structure of the nervous system and it allows the diaphragm to contract, which is necessary for breathing to occur. Let's talk about the physiology of breathing now. The respiratory and cardiovascular systems work together. They ensure that a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients is delivered to all of the cells of the body and remove carbon dioxide and waste products from the cells. The table on this slide defines ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration. So let's talk about that now. The process involved in our ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration. So ventilation is the physical act of moving air into and out of the lungs, which is necessary for oxygenation and respiration to occur. Inhalation is the active muscular part of breathing. The diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract during inhalation, which allows air to enter the body and travel to the lungs. The lungs require the movement of the chest and supporting structures to expand and contract during inhalation and exhalation. Partial pressure is the amount of gas in air or dissolved in fluids such as blood. It's measured in millimeters of mercury. The amount of gas in the oxygen or the partial pressure that resides in the alveoli is 104 millimeters of mercury. Carbon dioxide enters the alveoli from the blood and causes the carbon dioxide partial pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury. Oxygenated arterial blood from the heart has a partial pressure of oxygen that is lower than the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the pulmonary capillaries. The body attempts to equalize the partial pressure, which results in oxygen diffusion across the membrane into the blood.
oxygen and carbon dioxide both diffuse until the partial pressure in the air and the blood are equal. The mechanisms of ventilation can be illustrated by using a bell jar. Inhalation and chest expansion, and that's on the left, and the bell jar on the right. So, exhalation and chest contraction, and that's on the left and the bell jar on the right. Inspiration is focused on delivering oxygen to the alveoli. Not all inspired air reaches the alveoli for gas exchange. Tidal volume is a measure of depth of breathing. The amount of air in millimeters that is moved into and out of the lungs during a single breath. Tidal volume for the average adult is 500 milliliters. Dead space is the portion of inspired air that fails to reach the alveoli. Okay, so we talked about inhalation. Now with exhalation, unlike inhalation, exhalation does not normally require muscular effort. It's known as a passive process. It requires no energy. The diaphragm and the intercostal muscles relax, which decreases the size of the thorax. The smaller thorax compresses air in the lungs into a smaller space. The air pressure in the thorax is then higher than the outside pressure, and air is pushed out through the trachea. Air can enter and leave the lungs only if it travels through the trachea. This is why clearing and maintaining a patent airway is so important. Regulation of ventilation involves a complex series of receptors and feedback loops that sense gas concentrations in the body fluids and send messages to the respiratory center in the brain to adjust the rate and depth of ventilation. The body's need for oxygenation is constantly changing, and failure to meet this need may result in hypoxia, which is an extremely dangerous condition. The tissues and cells do not get enough oxygen, and if not corrected, patients may die quickly. For most people, the drive to breathe is based on pH changes in the blood and cerebral spinal fluid. Patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease have difficulty eliminating carbon dioxide through exhalation. Thus, they always have a higher level of carbon dioxide. This condition potentially alters their drive for breathing. So respiratory centers in the brain gradually ad adjust to accommodate high levels of carbon dioxide. In patients with COPD, the body uses a backup system known as a hypoxic drive to control breathing. This, so use caution when administering high concentrations of oxygen to patients with COPD. High concentrations of oxygen should never be withheld though from any patient who needs it. Patients who Severe respiratory and cardiovascular compromise should receive high concentrations of oxygen regardless of their underlying medical conditions. And so that kind of contradicts those three sentences. However, never withhold oxygen. Okay, so let's talk about early signs of hypoxia. It's restlessness, irritability, apprehension, and then a fast heart rate, so it's tachycardia, and anxiety. And then late signs of hypoxia will include mental status changes, weak or thready pulse, cyanosis, and conscious patients will complain of shortness of breath, and that is termed dyspnea. The best time to give a patient oxygen is before signs and symptoms of hypoxia appear. Okay, so we just talked about um, ventilation. Now we're going to talk about oxygenation. And then after that, we'll talk about respiration. So oxygenation, that's the process of loading oxygen molecules onto hemoglobin molecules in the bloodstream. It requires, um, it's required for internal respiration to take place. Oxygenation does not guarantee that internal respiration is taking place. So ventilation without oxygenation can occur. For example, in places where oxygen levels in the breathing air has been depleted, such as in a mine or a confined space. All right, so now respiration, and that's the actual exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the alveoli 
and in tissues of the body. Cells take energy from nutrients through a series of chemical processes known as metabolism, or also known as cellular respiration. So each cell combines nutrients and oxygen, producing energy and waste products, so mainly water and carbon dioxide. External respiration, and that's pulmonary respiration, that brings fresh air into the respiratory system and exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide between the alveoli and the blood in the pulmonary capillaries. Surfactant keeps alveoli expanded, expanded, making it easier for gas exchange to occur. And then internal respiration. So exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between systemic circulatory systems and the cells of the body. Oxygen passes from blood in capillaries to tissue cells. Carbon dioxide and cell waste pass from the cells into the capillaries where they are transported into the venous system back to the lung. All cells need a constant supply of oxygen to survive. So time is critical without oxygen. So between zero and one minute, cardiac irritability occurs. Zero to four minutes, your, our brain damage is not likely. But then when it comes to four to six minutes, brain damage is possible. Then from six to 10 minutes, brain damage is very likely. More than 10 minutes, there is irreversible brain damage occurs. So when there is enough oxygen, cells convert glucose into energy through aerobic metabolism. Without adequate oxygen, anaerobic metabolism takes place, which cannot meet the meta metabolic demands of the cell. If this process is not corrected, the cells will eventually die. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of respirations. There are factors in the nervous system that affect this. Chemoreceptors monitor levels of oxygen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen ions, and the pH of cerebral spinal fluid and provide feedback to the respiratory centers. Ventilation, perfusion ratio, and mismatch. So air and blood flow must be directed to the same place at the same time. Ventilation and perfusion must be matched. If failure to match ventilation and perfusion is cause of most abnormalities of oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. When ventilation is compromised, but perfusion continues, blood passes over some alveolar membranes without gas exchange taking place. This results in a lack of oxygen diffusing across the membrane and into blood circulation. Carbon dioxide is not able to diffuse across the membrane into the lungs and instead is recirculated within the bloodstream, which can lead to severe hypoxia. Similar problems can occur when perfusion across the alveolar membrane is disrupted. Factors affecting pulmonary ventilation include, so maintaining a pet patent airway is critical. Intrinsic factors that can cause airway obstructions are infections or allergic reactions or maybe unresponsiveness, so like the tongue is obstructing the airway. Then extrinsic factors that cause airway obstruction is trauma and foreign body airway obstruction factors that affect respiration. So there's external factors such as the atmospheric pressure and the partial pressure of oxygen in an ambient environment. And then there's internal factors such as conditions that reduce the surface area for gas exchange and consequently decrease the body's oxygen supply leading to inadequate tissue perfusion such as pneumonia or pulmonary edema or COPD um, emphysema. Okay, so circulatory compromise, um, obstruction of blood flow to individual cells and tissue is typically related to trauma injuries and emergencies. So things like pulmonary emboli or simple or tension pneumo, an open pneumo, which is also known as a sucking chest wound, and a hemothorax or a hemoneumothorax. 
you could have other causes of circulatory compromise, and those include blood loss, anemia, hypovolemic shock, and that's an abnormal decrease in blood volume, or vasodilatory shock, and that's an abnormal decrease in blood vessel diameter, decreasing blood pressure. Any patient suspected of being in shock should be treated aggressively to prevent further interruptions to tissue perfusion. All right, so let's get into the patient assessment. Recognizing adequate breathing. So, unless you are directly assessing a patient's airway, you should not be able to see or hear the patient breathe. Signs of normal breathing for adults are you have between 12 to 20 breaths per minute, regulatory, regular pattern of inhalation and exhalation, bilateral, clear, and equal lung sounds, so both sides should be clear, regular, equal chest rise and fall, and adequate depth, and that's also tidal volume. Recognizing abnormal breathing. So an awake alert adult who is talking to you usually has no immediate airway and breathing problems. Always have supplemental oxygen and a BVM or pocket mask close at hand to assist with breathing if it becomes necessary. Signs of abnormal breathing include fewer than 12 breaths a minute, more than 12 breaths a minute, in the presence of shortness of breath, and remember shortness of breath is also known as dyspnea, irregular rhythm, diminished, absent, or noisy auscultated breath sounds, so listening with your stethoscope auscultating, or reduced flow of expired air at nose and mouth. Unequal or inadequate chest expansion resulting in reduced tidal volume, increased effort of breathing, so like if they're really using those accessory muscles, shallow breathing, the skin is pale or cyanotic, cyanotic is blue, if they're cool or moist or clammy, or if skin is pulling in around the ribs or above the clavicles during inspiration, and that's known as retractions. A patient may appear to be breathing after the heart has stopped. These occasional gasping breaths are known as agonal gasps. Then you have the Cheyenne-Stokes respirations, and they are often seen in patients with a stroke or a head injury. Breathing with increasing rate and depth of respirations following by, followed by apnea or a lack of spontaneous breathing. Atoxic respirations have an irregular or unidentifiable pattern and may follow serious head injuries. Patients experiencing a metabolic or toxic disorder may display other abnormal respiratory patterns such as Cushmal respirations. So Cushmal respirations are deep, rapid respirations commonly seen in patients with metabolic acidosis. Patients with inadequate breathing need to be treated immediately. So emergency medical care airway management and supplemental oxygen and ventilatory support. You need the assessment of the respiration. So even though the patient may be ventilating appropriately, the actual exchange of carbon and oxygen, carbon dioxide and oxygen at the tissue level may still be compromised by several factors. It could be high altitudes or poisonous gases, including carbon monoxide. You could have enclosed spaces or a patient's level of consciousness and skin color are excellent indicators of respiration. When assessing patients, consider proper oxygenation, which can be assessed with a pulse ox. Oxygen saturation, or SpO2, is measured of the percentage of hemoglobin molecules that are bound in arterial blood. A pulse oximeter measures the percentage of hemoglobin saturation. So SpO2 should be 98% to 100% while breathing room air. Although no definitive threshold for normal value exists, an SpO2 of less than 96% in a non-smoker can indicate um, hypoxia. Pulse oximeters can take as long as 60 seconds to reflect changes in the patient's oxygenation status. 
that time delay is important because a patient can develop respiratory insufficiency well before the pulse ox values begin to decline. It is critical to monitor the patient and supplement the assessment with information from the pulse ox. Pulse ox symmetry is considered a routine vital sign and can be used as part of any patient assessment. Factors that cause inaccurate pulse ox readings. So it, you could have hypovolemia or severe peripheral vasoconstriction, time delay in detecting respiratory insufficiency, or you could have um, nail polish or dirty fingers, also carbon monoxide poisoning. Pulse oximeters do not replace a complete assessment. Pulse oximetry cannot measure the effectiveness of ventilation or provide information about cellular metabolism. To assess ventilation, you will need to measure the end tidal CO2. End tidal CO2 is measured by capnography and capnography devices. Okay, so let's talk about opening the airway. Emergency medical care begins with ensuring an open airway. You have to rapidly assess whether an unconscious patient has a patent airway and pulse and is breathing adequately. Airway and breathing are two closely related but separate components. Adequate breathing does not always equal an inadequate airway. Position the patient correctly, and the supine position is the most effective. Okay, so sometimes the airway must be opened and assessed in the position in which you find the patient, such as in a vehicle entrapment. A patient found in the prone position, prone, remember, means laying face down, must be repositioned. You need to log roll the patient as a unit so the head, neck, and spine all move together without twisting. While care should be taken to avoid injury, remember that airway management almost always takes priority and should not be delayed when caring for patients with life-threatening conditions. Unconscious patients should be moved as a unit because of the potential for spinal injury. In an unconscious patient, the most common airway obstruction is the patient's tongue, and which falls back into the throat when the muscles of the throat and tongue relax. Other causes of an airway obstruction include dentures, blood, vomitus, mucus, food, and other foreign airway objects. Okay, so the first way to open the um, airway is going to be the head tilt chin lift maneuver. This will open the airway in most patients. For patients who have not sustained or are not suspected of having sustained spinal injuries, this simple maneuver is sometimes all that it's needed for a patient to resume breathing. Okay, so follow these steps to perform the head tilt chin lift maneuver. With the patient supine, position yourself beside the patient's head. Place the heel of one hand on the patient's forehead and apply firm backward pressure with the palm. Place the fingertips of the other hand under the patient's lower jaw Lift the chin upwards with the entire lower jaw, helping to tilt the head back. Now we're going to talk about the second method, and this is the jaw thrust maneuver. If you suspect a cervical spine injury, use the jaw thrust maneuver and follow these steps. Kneel above the patient's head. Place your fingers behind the angles of the lower jaw. Move the jaw upward and use your thumbs to help position the lower jaw. Once the airway has been opened, assess whether breathing has returned by quickly looking at the chest and observing for obvious movement. With complete airway obstruction, there will be no movement. The chest and abdomen may rise and fall with the patient's frantic attempts to breathe, or chest wall movement alone does not indicate that breathing is adequate. So opening the mouth, even though you may have opened the airway with the head tilt chin lift or the jaw thrust maneuver, the patient's mouth may be closed. To open the mouth, place the tips of your index finger and thumb on the patient's teeth. Open the mouth by pushing your thumb and on the lower teeth and index finger on the upper teeth. The pushing motion will cause the index finger and thumb to cross over each other,
which is why this is called the cross finger technique. The photos on this slide demonstrate how to perform the jaw thrust maneuver. And you can see that they're kneeling above the patient's head. They have the fingers behind the angles of the jaw and they moving the jaw upward using their thumbs to help position the lower jaw. The completed maneuver should look like the second photo. Okay, so suctioning, we're gonna talk about next. And you must keep the airway clear to ventilate and um, the patient properly. If the airway is not clear, you will force liquids and fluids secretions into the lungs and cause um, a possibly a complete airway obstruction. If you hear gurgling, the patient needs suctioning. So you have, we'll talk about the suctioning equipment. You could have portable or hand operated and fixed, which are mounted equipment. A portable suction unit must provide enough vacuum pressure and flow to allow you to suction the mouth and nose effectively. Hand operated suction units with disposable chambers are reliable, effective, and relatively inexpensive. A fixed suctioning unit should generate airflow of more than 40 liters a minute and a vacuum of more than 300 millimeters of mercury when the tubing is clamped. A portable and fixed unit should be fitted with the following. They should have wide bore, thick walled, non kinking tubing, plastic rigid pharmageal suction tips. These are um, called tonsil tips or yankar tips, non rigid plastic catheters called French or whistle tips, non breakable disposal collection bottle, and a water supply for rinsing the tips. A suction catheter is a hollow cylindrical device used to remove fluids from the airway. A tonsil tip catheter is the best kind of catheter for infants and children. Tips with curved contour allow for easy rapid placement in the oral pharynx. French or whistle tip catheters are soft plastic non-rigid catheters. They are used to suction the nose and liquid secretions in the back of the mouth and in situations where you cannot use a rigid catheter, such as a patient with a stoma or a patient with clenched teeth, if suctioning the nose is necessary. So techniques for suctioning. So inspect your suction equipment regularly to ensure it is proper working condition. Steps to operate the suction unit include Check the unit for proper assembly of all its parts. Turn on the suction unit and test to ensure a vacuum pressure of more than 300 millimeters of mercury. Select and attach the appropriate suction catheter to the tubing. Never suction the mouth or nose for more than 15 seconds at a time for adults, 10 seconds for children, and 5 seconds for infants. Suctioning can result in hypoxia. Rinse the catheter and tubing with water to prevent clogging and repeat suctioning only after the patient has adequately been ventilated and reoxygenated. To properly suction a patient, see skill drill 10-3 in your book. Sometimes a patient may have secretions or vomitus that cannot be suctioned quickly and easily, and some units cannot remove objects such as teeth, foreign bodies, and food. In these cases, remove the catheter from the patient's mouth, log roll the patient onto their side, and clear the mouth carefully with a gloved finger. If a patient who requires assisted ventilations produces frothy secretions as quickly as you can suction them, suction the airway for 15 seconds, unless, of course, in infants and children, then ventilate them for two minutes, then continue this alternating pattern of suctioning and ventilating until all secretions have been cleared from the airway. Continuous ventilation is not appropriate if vomitus or other particles are present in the airway. Clean and de decontaminate your suctioning unit after each use, of course. Okay, so now let's talk about basic airway adjuncts. An airway adjunct prevents obstruction of upper airway by the tongue and allows for passage of air and oxygen to the lungs. 
The first one we're going to talk about is oral pharyngeal airways. They keep the tongue from balking the upper airway. They make it easier to suction the oral pharynx if necessary. Suctioning is possible through the opening down the center or along either side of the oral pharyngeal airway. So indications for OPs or oral pharyngeals include unresponsive patients without a gag reflex or apneic patients being ventilated with a BVM. Contraindications are conscious patients or any patient who has an intact gag reflex. The gag reflex is a protective reflex mechanism that keeps food from entering the airway. Attempting to insert an oral airway in a patient with an intact gag reflex may result in vomiting or spasms of the vocal cords. The oral airway is a good way to help maintain the airway of a spinal injury patient. An oral airway may make the head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust maneuvers easier to perform. And the oral airway that is too big, though, can push the tongue back into the pharynx, blocking the airway. To insert an airway properly, see skill drill 10-4 in your book. If you encounter difficulty inserting the oral airway, an alternate method may be used, inserting with a 90-degree rotation. So that's uh, skill drill 10-5 in your book. After the oral pharyngeal airways, there are the nasal pharyngeal airways, and you'll hear these pronounced as NP. Indications of NPs include patients who are unresponsive or has an altered level of consciousness, patient who has an intact gag reflex, patient who is unable to maintain his or her own airway spontaneously. So patients with altered mental status or who have just had a seizure may benefit from this type of airway. Consult medical control before inserting a nasal pharyngeal airway in a patient who has sustained severe trauma to the head or face because it may penetrate into the brain. A nasal pharyngeal airway is also better tolerated in patients who have an intact gag reflex. It's less likely to cause vomiting compared to the oral pharyngeal airway. Indications are semi-conscious or unconscious patients with an intact gag reflex, patients who otherwise will not tolerate an oral pharyngeal airway. Contraindications are severe head injury with blood draining from the nose or a history of a fractured nasal bone. So to insert in this airway correctly, uh, see the skill drill 10-6 in your book. Okay, so maintaining the airway. The recovery position, and you can see it on this photo, is used to help maintain an airway in an unconscious patient who is not injured, not injured, and is breathing on his or her own with a normal respiratory rate and adequate tidal volume. Steps to put the patient in the recovery position include roll the patient on either side so that the head, shoulders, and torso move at the same time without twisting. Extend the patient's lower arm and place the upper hand under his or her cheek. For patients who have resumed spontaneous breathing after being resuscitated, the recovery position will prevent aspiration of vomit. The position is not appropriate for patients with suspected spinal, hip, or pelvic injuries who are unconscious and require ventilatory assistance. Reposition such patients to provide adequate airway access, access while maintaining appropriate spinal immobilization. All right, so now we're going to get into supplemental oxygen and the devices. So always give supplemental oxygen to patients who are hypoxic because not enough oxygen is being supplied to the tissues and cells of the body. Some tissues and organs, such as the heart, central nervous system, lungs, kidneys, and liver need a constant supply of oxygen to function. Never withhold oxygen from any patient who might benefit from it, especially if you must assist with ventilations. When ventilating a patient in cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest, use high concentration supplemental oxygen. <music> 
So let's talk about the equipment. Become familiar with how oxygen is stored and the various hazards associated with its use. Oxygen cylinders, so the oxygen that you will give to the patients is usually supplied as compressed gas in green, seamless steel or aluminum cylinders. Some cylinders may be silver or chrome with a green area around the valve stem on the top. Newer cylinders are often made of aluminum or spun steel. Older cylinders are usually much heavier. Check the cylinder is labeled for medical oxygen. Look for letters and numbers stamped into the metal on the collar of the cylinder. Check the month and the year the stamps indicating when the cylinder was last tested. So aluminum cylinders are tested every five years and composite cylinders are tested every three years. Most often the D or jumbo D and M cylinders will be used. And they can be carried from the unit to the patient. The M tank remains on board the unit as the main supply tank. Other sizes are A, E, G, H and K. In alternating naming system for identifying the size of the cylinder, cylinders are named and labeled with M for medical, followed by the number. The length of time you can use the oxygen cylinder depends on the pressure in the cylinder and flow rate. There's also liquid oxygen, and it's more commonly used alternative to compressed gas. Liquid oxygen containers tend to be more expensive than compressed gas. They hold a larger volume and therefore do not need to be filled as often. They weigh less, they need to be kept upright, and they have special requirements for filling, large volume storage, and cylinder transfer. People who receive long-term oxygen therapy use liquid oxygen units. So let's talk about the safety considers considerations. You must handle gas cylinders carefully because their contents are under pressure. So make sure the correct pressure regula regulator is firmly attached before transporting cylinders. A puncture or hole in the tank can turn into a deadly missile. Secure cylinders with mounting brackets when they are stored on the ambulance. Oxygen cylinders that are in use during transport should be positioned correctly and secured. So let's talk about the pin indexing system. It prevents mistakes as an oxygen regulator being accidentally connected to a carbon dioxide cylinder. When preparing for oxygen, administering oxygen, check that the pinholes on the cylinder exactly match the co corresponding pins on the regulator. Each cylinder of a specific gas type has a given pattern and a given number of pins following accepted national standards. For large cylinders, the safety system is the American standard safety system. Oxygen cylinders are equipped with threaded oxygen outlet valves. Inside and outside, thread sizes vary on the gas in the cylinder. Like the pin indexing, this prevents accidental attachment of a regulator to the wrong cylinder. Okay, then pressure regulators. Pressure regulators reduce the cylinder's pressure to a useful therapeutic range for the patient, usually between 40 to 70 PSI. After the pressure is reduced to a workable level, the finer, final attachment for delivering the gas is one of the following. So it could be a quick connect female fitting that will accept a quick connected male or a flow meter that will permit the regulated release of the gas measured in liters per minute. Flow meters are usually permanently attached to a pressure regulator on emergency medical equipment. A pressure compensated flow meter incorporates a float ball within a tapered calibrated tube. It is affected by gravity and must always be kept upright. So these are used usually in fixed places like on a wall. And a Bergdon gauge flow meter is a gauge calibrated to record flow rate. It can be used in any position and generally considered outdated.
procedures for operating and administering oxygen. So to place an oxygen cylinder into service and administer medical oxygen to the patient, see skill drill 10-7 in your book. And so some hazards of supplemental oxygen include combustion and oxygen toxicity. Let's talk about combustion first. This is um, oxygen does not burn or explode. It speeds up the combustion process. So a spark, a small spark even, such as a glowing cigarette, can become a flame. You want to keep any possible source of fire away from the area while oxygen's in use and make sure the area is adequately ventilated, especially in industrial settings. Sparks occur during vehicle extrication are a possible source of ignition as well. So never leave the oxygen cylinder standing unattended because it can be knocked over, injuring a patient or damaging equipment. Oxygen toxicity. So the administration of oxygen to patients is a common practice. While many patients in the pre-hospital setting require high concentrations of oxygen, not all patients do. Excessive supplemental oxygen can have a detrimental effect on patients with certain illnesses such as COPD. Oxygen toxicity refers to damage to cellular tissue due to excessive oxygen levels in the blood. Increased cellular oxygen levels contribute to the production of oxygen-free radicals, which can lead to tissue damage and cellular death in some patients. The International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation Guidelines published by the American Heart Association recognize that there may be negative effects of oxygen toxicity and recommend that oxygen be administered to patients experiencing signs of a myocardial infarct when they have signs of heart failure, are short of breath, or have a room air oxygen saturation less than 94%. When pulse pulse oximetry is available, tailor oxygen therapy to the patient's needs and administer the minimum amount of oxygen necessary to maintain oxygen saturation at or above 94%. Expe exceptions to these minimums include patients who have been exposed to carbon monoxide. And so oxygen delivery equipment we're gonna talk about next. In general, oxygen delivery equipment used in the field should be limited to non-rebreather mask, bag valve mask, and nasal cannulas. You may encounter other oxygen devices during transport between medical facilities, and we're going to talk about some of these as well. So first, though, a non-rebreather mask. This is the preferred way to give oxygen in the pre-hospital setting to patients who are breathing adequately but are suspected of having or showing signs of hypoxia. So this combines a mask with a reservoir bag system. Oxygen fills the reservoir bag attached to the mask by a one-way valve. Exhaled gas escapes through a flapper valve port at the cheek areas of the mask and prevent the patient from rebreathing exhaled gases. Make sure the reservoir bag is full before placing the mask on the patient. Adjust the flow rate so the bag does not collapse when the patient's breathing, so usually between 10 to 15 liters a minute. If the bag does collapse, increase the flow rate. When oxygen therapy is discontinued, remove the mask from the patient's face and use a pediatric non-rebreather mask for infants and children. It has a smaller reservoir bag. Okay, so this is a nasal cannula and delivery uh, oxygen, through it delivers oxygen through two small tube-like prongs that fit into the patient's nostrils. It can provide 24 to 44 in percent inspired oxygen when the flow meter is set at one to six liters a minute. For patient comfort, flow rates above six liters a minute are not recommended. When in anticipate a long transport time, consider using humidified oxygen. Over a prolonged period, a nasal cannula can dry or irritate the mucous membrane lining of the nose. In a pre-hospital setting, a nasal cannula has limited use. A patient who breathes through the mouth or has nasal obstructions will get little or no benefit. So 
always try to give high flow oxygen through a non-rebreather mask if necessary. Then there's also partial rebreathing masks. They're similar to non-rebreathing masks except there is no one-way valve between the mask and the reservoir. Patients rebreathe a small amount of their exhaled air and the oxygen enriches the air measured mixture so the patient receive about 80 to 90 percent oxygen. To convert a non-rebreather mask to a partial rebreather mask, just remove the one-way valve between the mask and the reservoir bag. And then there's Venturi mask. So a number of attachments can vary the percentage of oxygen while a constant flow is maintained from the regulator. The Venturi principle uses air to be drawn into the flow of oxygen as it passes a hole in the line. The Venturi mask is a medium flow device that delivers about 24 to 40% oxygen depending on the manufacturer. It's useful in long-term management of physiologically stable patients. And then you have tracheostomy masks. Patients with tracheostomies do not breathe through their mouth and nose. So the tracheostomy mask covers the tracheostomy hole and have a strap that goes around the neck. These may not be available in the emergency setting, in which case you can improvise by placing a face mask over the stoma. Although the mask is shaped to fit the face, you can usually get an adequate fit over the patient's neck by adjusting the strap. Okay, so um, humidification or humidified oxygen. We talked about this a couple slides ago, but some EMS systems provide humidified oxygen during extended transports or for certain conditions such as croup. Dry oxygen is not considered harmful for short-term use, so many EMS systems do not use humidified oxygen in the pre-hospital setting. Always refer to medical control or local protocols for guidance involving patient treatment issues. An assisted and artificial ventilation. So assisted and artificial ventilation techniques are probably the most important skill in any EMS um, at any level. Basic airway and ventilation techniques are extremely effective when administered appropriately. Mastery of these techniques at the EMT level is imperative. Patients who are breathing inadequately, so either too fast or too slow, or with reduced tidal volume, are usually unable to speak in complete sentences. So follow standard precautions as needed when managing a patient's airway. Assisting ventilation in respiratory distress failure, so intervene quickly to prevent further deterioration. Two treatment options, so you could be assisted ventilation and continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP. The purpose of assisted ventilations is to improve the overall oxygenation and ventilatory status of the patient. So signs and symptoms of inadequate ventilation uh, include altered mental status or inadequate minute volume or excessive accessory mu uh, muscle use and fatigue. To assist a patient with ventilations using a BVM, you want to explain the procedure to the patient. Place the mask over the patient's nose and mouth and squeeze the bag each time the patient breathes, maintaining the same rate as the patient. After the initial five to 10 breaths, slowly adjust the rate and deliver an appropriate tidal volume. Adjust the rate and tidal volume to maintain an adequate minute volume. Artificial ventilation, so patients in respiratory arrest need immediate treatment to live. Once you determine that a patient is not breathing, begin artificial ventilation immediately. You have available methods such as mouth to mass technique, or one to two person BVM, or manually triggered ventilation device. So normal ventilation varies um, versus uh, positive pressure ventilation. So artificial ventilations are necessary to sustain life, but not the same as normal breathing. In normal breathing, the diaphragm contracts and negative pressure is generated in the chest cavity which sucks air into the chest. 
but during positive pressure ventilation, it's generated by a device which forces air into the chest cavity. With positive pressure ventilation, increased intrathoracic pressure causes compression of the vena cava and reduces blood return to the heart, which reduces the amount of blood pumped by the heart. More volume is required to have the same effect for as normal breathing, which pushes the airway walls out of their normal anatomic shape. Air is forced into the stomach, causing gastric distension that could result in vomiting and aspiration. The EMT must regulate the rate and volume of artificial respirations to help prevent the drop in cardiac output. Cardiac output equals stroke volume times the heart rate. So ventilation rates. So an adult, you want to ventilate one breath every five to six seconds. And then for a child and infant, you want to ventilate one breath every three to five seconds. Okay, so let's talk about mouth to mouth and mouth to mask ventilation next. A barrier device is routinely used in mouth to mouth ventilations. A plastic barrier is placed on the patient's face that includes a one-way valve to prevent the backflow of secretions, vomit, and gases. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilations without a barrier device should be provided only in extreme situations. A mask with an oxygen inlet provides oxygen during mouth-to-mask -mouth ventilations. It supplements the air supplied by your lungs, the gas you exhale contains about 16% oxygen. With the mouth-to-mouth -mouth systems, the patients get a benefit of significant oxygen enrichment. This system frees both the EMT's hands to help keep the airway open and provide a better seal between the mask and face. To provide mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation, see skill drill 10-8. So signs of adequate ventilations. So patient's color will improve, chest rises adequately, no resistant when ventilating, and you hear and feel air escape as the patient exhales. To increase the oxygen concentration, administer high flow oxygen at 15 liters a minute through the oxygen inlet valve on the mask. Combined with your exhaled breath, this will deliver about 55% of oxygen. Okay, and then there's the bag valve mask. It's the most common method used to ventilate patients in the field. With an oxygen flow rate of 15 liters a minute, a BVM can deliver nearly 100% of oxygen. The BVM provides less tidal volume than the mouth-to-mask ventilation, but delivers a much higher concentration of oxygen. An experienced EMT can provide adequate tidal volume as a new EMT develop proficiency by ventilating airway training mannequins before using a BVM on a patient. If you have difficulty adequately ventilating a patient with a BVM, switch immediately to another method such as a mouth-to-mask technique. BVM components include a disposable self-refilling bag, could have no pop-off valve or a disabled pop-off valve, a non-breathing outlet valve, an oxygen reservoir that allows for delivery of high concentrated oxygen, one-way or no jam inlet valve that uh, with a flow rate of up to 15 liters a minute, and also a transparent face mask. So it offers the capacity, um, capability of performing under extreme heat and cold conditions. So the tidal volume, an adult um, BVM has the ability to administer between 1,200 and 1,600 milliliters. Pediatric is 500 to 700 milliliters, and the infant is 150 to 240 milliliters. The volume of oxygen delivered is based on observing chest rise and fall. When using a BVM with a high flow oxygen on an adult patient, squeeze the bag just enough to cause a noticeable rise of the patient's chest. And that's only about 600 liters. By delivering just enough tidal volume to see the chest rise and fall, the risk of gastric distension and associated complications are reduced. 
it is impractical for EMTs to accurately measure tidal volume in milliliters per kilogram in the field. The key is to watch for good chest rise and fall. Let this determine the appropriate amount of volume to deliver. So with the BVM technique, whenever possible, work together with your partner to provide a BVM ventilation. One EMT maintains a good mask seal by securing the mask to the patients with two hands and the other EMT squeezes the bag. To use a one person BVM, follow these steps. Select the proper size, kneel above the head, and maintain the patient's neck in an extended position unless you suspect a cervical spine injury. Use your knees to stabilize the head. Open the airway, suction as needed, insert an oral or nasal airway, and place the mask on the patient's face. If the mask is too large, round cuff around the ventilation port, center the port of the, over the patient's mouth. So, Create a seal by holding your index finger over the lower part of the mask and your thumb over the upper part of the mask. We call this the EC clamp. Bring the lower jaw up to the mask with at least three fingers of your hand. This helps maintain an open airway. Squeeze the bag with your other hand until you see adequate chest rise and fall. Perform this in a rhythmic manner every once every five seconds for an adult and once every three seconds for an infant and children. In patients with ongoing CPR and an advanced airway in place, such as an endotracheal tube, a laryngeal mask airway, or a king airway, use a simplified ventilation rate of one breath every six seconds without pausing for chest compressions. If two EMTs are available, follow these steps. One EMT holds the mask in position by placing the thumbs over the top part of the mask and the index finger over the bottom half. The first EMT uses at least three fingers of the hands to bring the lower jaw up to the mask. This helps to seal the mask to the face and maintain an open airway. For patients who are breathing too slowly, and that's hypoventilation, with reduced tidal volumes, squeeze the bag as the patient breathes for the next five to 10 breaths. Then slowly adjust the rate and deliver tidal volume until adequate minute ventilation is achieved. For a patient who is breathing too fast, and that's known as hyperventilation, so hyper, with reduced tidal volume, explain this procedure to the patient if the patient is coherent and then initially assist the respiratory, um, the respirations at the rate that the patient's breathing, so the same thing, by squeezing the bag each time the patient inhales. Then for the next five to 10 breaths, slowly adjust the rate and the delivered tidal volume until an adequate minute volume is achieved. If the patient's chest does not rise and fall, you may need to reposition your hand or use an airway adjunct. If the patient's chest does not rise and fall, after you have made these corrections, check for an airway obstruction. If an obstruction is not present, attempt ventilations using an alternate method, such as a mouth to mass technique. The BVM may be used in conjunction with an endotracheal tube or with another advanced airway technique. All right, so when you talk about bag valve mask, you need to talk about gastric distension, unfortunately. So when using a BVM or any other ventilation device, be alert for gastric distension. And so get what gastric distension is, it's inflation of the stomach with air. It's most commonly affects children, but can also affect adults. Most likely to occur when you ventilate the patient too forcefully or too rapidly with a BVM or pocket mask. It may occur when the airway is obstructed as a result of the foreign body or improper head position. For this reason, we wanna give slow, gentle breaths during artificial ventilation over one second, okay? So slight gastric distension is not of concern. Severe inflation of the stomach is dangerous though. And gastric distension is a common complication with a manually triggered ventilation device. A key reason these devices are not highly recommended in the field. 
to prevent or alleviate gastric distension, ensure that the patient's airway is properly positioned, ventilate the patient at the appropriate rate, and ventilate the patient at the appropriate volume. If the patient's stomach appears to be distending, recheck and reposition the head and watch for a rise and fall of the chest as you perform rescue breathing. Continue slow rescue breathing without attempting to expel the stomach contents. And then there's passive ventilation. So the process of expansion and contraction of the chest creates a pump for air movement in and out of the chest. During cardiac arrest, you are responsible for providing chest compressions to circulate blood and artificial ventilations to oxygenate the hemoglobin. Since chest wall movement assists in ventilation process, patients receive high quality chest compression benefit from passive ventilation. In passive ventilation, air movement in and out of the chest cavity occurs passively as a result of compressing the chest. Passive ventilation can be enhanced by inserting an oral pharyngeal airway and providing supplemental oxygen to the patient. You can also improve oxygenation by applying supplemental oxygen with a nasal cannula or a non rebreathing mask. And then the manually triggered ventilation devices. So they're also known as flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation devices. They allow a single rescuer to use both hands to maintain a mask to face seal when providing positive pressure ventilation. This reduces rescuer fatigue associated with using a BVM on extended transports. There are disadvantages and we mentioned them earlier on another slide because it may be difficult to maintain adequate ventilation without assistance should not be used routinely because of the high instance of gastric distension and possible damage to structures within the chest cavity. Manually triggered ventilation device components are, they have peak flow rates of 100% oxygen at up to 40 liters. They have inspiratory pressure safety release valves and audible alarms that sound when you exceed the relief pressure and proper training in and considerable practice is required with these. As with BVMs, you must make sure that there is an effective seal between the patient's face and mask, and the amount of pressure required varies according to the patient's size, lung volume, and lung condition. There's also automatic transport ventilators, or ATV resuscitators, the ATV is a manually triggered ventilation device attached to a control box that allows the variables of ventilation to be set. A BVM and mask should always be prepared and ready to use if they have, you have a failure with this ATV. Most models have adjustments for respiratory rate and tidal volume. The pressure relief valve may lead to hypoventilation in patients and um, constant reassessment of the patient is necessary to assess for full chest recoil. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about continuous positive airway pressure, and this is also known as CPAP. It's a non-invasive ventilatory support for patients experiencing respiratory distress. Many patients and uh, people diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea wear CPAP unit at night to maintain their airways while they sleep and CPAP is becoming widely used at the EMT level. So CPAP increases pressure in the lungs, opens collapsed alveoli, and pushes more oxygen across the alveolar membrane and forces interstitial fluid back into pulmonary circulation. The therapy is typically delivered through a face mask held to the head with a strapping system. Many CPAP systems use oxygen as a driving force to deliver the positive ventilatory pressure to the patient. Use caution in patients with potentially low blood pressure because CPAP causes a drop in cardiac output. So indications are the patient has to be alert and able to follow commands. 
and there has to um, be displaying obvious signs of moderate to severe respiratory distress from a condition such as pulmonary edema or COPD, so obstructive pulmonary disease. The patient has to be breathing rapidly such that it affects the overall minute volume, so usually greater than 26 um, breaths a minute. And the pulse ox reading is less than 90%. Contraindications are, of course, if the patient's in respiratory arrest, um, signs and symptoms of a pneumo or any chest trauma, patient who has a trach, or active uh, gastrointestinal bleeding or vomiting, patient who is unable to follow verbal commands, or always reassess the patient for signs of deterioration or respiratory failure. So when you put it on, you have the components of the CPAP unit. You have a generator, a mask, a circuit containing the coordinated tubing, um, bacteria filter, and a one-way valve. The CPAP generator creates the resistance throughout the respiratory cycle, and the resistance creates a back pressure into the airway that pushes open the smaller airway structures. The amount of pressure can be determined by using a valve within the CPAP system. The pressure of 7 0.0 or 10.0 centimeters H2O is generally an accepted therapeutic range. Most CPAP units are powered by oxygen and disposable CPAP devices are lightweight and relatively easy to operate. And to use CPAP, see skill drill 10-10 in your book. So there are complications, and some patients may find CPAP um, claustrophobic and uh, resist the application of the mask. Due to high volume of pressure generated by CPAP, pneumothorax is a risk, and high pressure in the chest can lower the patient's blood pressure. So if a patient shows signs of deterioration, remove the CPAP and begin the positive pressure ventilation with a BVM attached to high flow oxygen. Okay, so now let's talk about some special considerations when it comes to um, airway management. The first we're going to talk about is stomas and tracheostomy tubes. So patients who have a laryngectomy, so that's the surgical removal of the larynx, have a permanent tracheal stoma, which is an opening in the neck that connects the trachea directly to the skin. This is known as a tracheostomy. Patients may have other openings in the neck depending on the type of operation performed. Ignore any opening other than the midline tracheal stoma. It is the only one that can be used to put air into the patient's lungs. Neither the head tilt or the chin lift nor the jaw thrust maneuver is required to ventilate a patient with a stoma. If the patient has a tracheostomy tube, ventilate the tube with a BVM. A standard 50, 15 to 22 millimeter adapter on the BVM will fit onto the tube in, in the tracheal stoma. Use 100% oxygen attached directly to the BVM. If the patient has a stoma but no tube, use an infant or child mask with the BVM to make a seal over the stoma. Seal the patient's mouth and nose with one hand to prevent the leak of air um, through the upper airway when, the ventilate, when you ventilate the stoma. If you cannot ventilate the patient with the stoma, try suctioning the stoma with the mouth of a French or soft tip catheter. Seal the stoma while giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. Okay, another special um, consideration is a foreign body airway obstruction. So if the obstruction completely blocks the airway, it's a true emergency. It's going to result in death if not treated immediately. In an adult, sudden foreign body airway obstructions usually occur during a meal. And in a child, it can occur while eating, playing, or crawling. So at any time with the child. By far the most common airway obstruction in an unconscious patient, I cannot reiterate this enough, is the tongue, it, which relaxes and falls back into the throat. This causes an airway obstruction that do not involve foreign bodies. There's also swelling from infection or an acute allergic reaction. 
repeated attempts to clear the airway can be dangerous, and these patients require specific emergency medical care and rapid transport to the hospital. Also, uh, trauma, so tissue damage from injury can, um, can create an obstruction that is not from a foreign body. But you have to recognize this. So early recognition of airway obstruction is crucial. You have mild airway obstruction. So you have a couple different types. So you have mild, moderate, or severe. So let's talk about these. Patients with a mild airway obstruction can still exchange air, but will have varying degrees. Great care must be taken to prevent a mild airway obstruction from becoming a severe airway obstruction. The patient may have noisy breathing and may be coughing. With good air exchange, the patient can cough forcefully, although you may hear wheezing between coughs. Wheezing usually indicates a mild, lower airway obstruction. As long as the patient can breathe, cough forcefully, or talk, you should not interfere with the patient's efforts to expel the foreign object on his or her own. Just continually reassess the patient's condition. With poor air exchange, the patient has a weak, ineffective cough and may have increased difficulty breathing, such as strider. And that's that high-pitched um, noise that is heard mainly on inspiration. So strider indicates mild upper airway treatment immediately as if it was a severe airway obstruction. When you have a severe airway obstruction, patients cannot breathe or talk or cough. The patient may clutch or gasp the throat, and that's that universal distress sign, and you could see it on the slide, the photo, and they begin to turn cyanotic and have extreme difficulty breathing. There is no or uh, little or no air movement. And you could ask that conscious patient, are you choking? And if they nod yes, you need to provide immediate treatment. If the obstruction is not clear quickly, the amount of oxygen in the patient's blood will decrease dramatically. If not treated, the patient will become unconscious. Some patients will be unconscious as you form your general impression. You may not know that the airway obstruction is the cause. Other causes could be a stroke or a heart attack or trauma or seizures or drug overdoses. If the patient is found unresponsive, does not appear to be breathing, and does not have a pulse, of course you're gonna begin CPR. When you open the airway and attempt two ventilations following chest compressions, it will be obvious if the airway is blocked. If there is no chest rise and fall after several attempts to ventilate, or if you feel resistance when ventilating, consider the possibility of an airway obstruction. Resistance to ventilation can also be due to poor lung compliance. Emergency management care for foreign body obstruction. So let's talk about this. You want to perform a head tilt chin lift maneuver to clear the tongue. Of course, if spinal, cord tra spinal trauma is suspected, open the airway with the jaw thrust maneuver. Large pieces of vomited food, mucus, loose dentures, or blood clots in the mouth should be swept forward and out of the mouth with your gloved finger. When available, perform suctioning to maintain a clear airway. Abdominal thrusts are the most effective method of dislodging and forcing an object out of the air of, an, of a conscious patient's. Residual air always presents in the lungs, is compressed upward and used to expel the object. Use the abdominal thrust until the object dislodges or the patient becomes unconsciousness, unconscious. For the unresponsive patient with a severe foreign body airway obstruction, reassess to confirm apnea and inability to ventilate. Begin chest compressions as you would for CPR following 30 compressions to two breath ratio. At the completion of the 30 compressions, perform a tongue jaw lift by grasping the jaw, jaw with your thumb and index finger. Place your thumb onto the tip of the patient's lower teeth and the tongue while placing your index finger under the bony portion of the chin. 
be careful not to compress the soft tissues under the chin. Pull the jaw mouth open and look in the back of the oropharynx for any foreign bodies. If you see an object, remove it with your glove finger and suction. Never performed a blind sweep of the back of the oropharynx, which may push an object further down the airway, making the obstruction worse. If you're unsuccessful, begin rapid transport and continue abdominal thrusts on the way to the hospital. Treat patients with a mild airway obstruction and poor oxygen exchange as if they have a severe obstruction. Patients with mild airway obstruction and good air exchange should be monitored closely for deterioration. If the patient is unable to clear the airway and remains conscious, support or let the patient control the airway position that is most efficient and comfortable. Provide supplemental oxygen and transport. When it comes to dental appliances, so many dental appliances can cause airway obstruction. Some examples of those are crowns or a bridge or dentures, or also pieces of braces. Manually remove the dental appliance before providing ventilations if it's loose. Leave while sitting in place though, because it could provide a more structure to the face and help to provide a good mass feel, seal. Loose dentures interfere with the process and should be removed, um, just as I said, and if possible, place dislodged dentures in a container and transport them with the patient. Okay, facial bleeding is the last thing we're gonna talk about today. So airway problems can be particularly challenging in patients with serious facial injuries. The blood supply to the face is very rich, so injuries can result in severe tissue swelling and bleeding into the airway. You need to control bleeding with direct pressure and suction as necessary. And we're gonna talk about this more in the facial injuries chapter, uh, the trauma chapters. Okay, so thank you for joining us for Chapter 10 Airway Management. If you liked this lecture, go ahead and press the like button and subscribe to our channel. And thank you for joining us today.